Hello and welcome back to the channel. In the previous episodes of how to build a compiler with LLVM and MLIR, we had a brief look over the different subsystems and different pieces of a compiler like the reader or parser, the abstract syntax tree and the semantic analyzer. But we had to skip over some of the core functionality and core concepts just because they deserve their own episode. So in today's episode, we're going to do have a look at the setting context, the namespace and the environment. But before we get started, I have to mention that uh, because the Serene compiler is under heavy development and, how, and because how the development process is going on, uh, I have to go back, of, uh, often I have to go back and make uh, big changes to, the dif to different subsystems. For example, at the moment I'm working on the JIT and I had to change how the namespaces work. Um, so everything that we talk about today uh, might change in the future and i'm going to document those changes and create new episodes for any major change describing uh, uh, the rationale behind the change and explain how they works how they work okay so with that being said let uh, let's start today's episode by, ta uh, by talking about the namespaces namespaces are kind of the most important concept in the list in the Serene language itself because namespaces are the unit of compilation in the Serene compiler basically talking about uh, a conceptual uh, namespace it is a mean to categorize different names into different buckets in order to avoid name collisions and stuff like that uh, some of the modern Lisps like Clojure supports namespaces. Namespaces are really important in Clojure as well. But in um, the, the difference between uh, namespace and let's say a module in, uh, in a language like Python is that in Serene, namespaces are the unit of compilation. That means whenever we want to uh, compile a program that is written in uh, Serene, the compiler will understand only namespaces. So we, we would ask the compiler to compile the namespace foo for us. It knows how to look up the namespace foo in the file system or maybe in the future in a zip file or something like that. It knows how to retrieve the namespace and it knows how to create a how to compile that namespace into a target code let's say let's assume we have a c compiler when we give it a c file it reads the file and generate an object file for us that contains the target code for that given file in in the Serene compiler we can we still can pass a, like a file to the compiler and ask it to compile it for us but we're going to use namespaces instead so in a real example, we would ask the compiler to compile the namespace foo for us. The compiler knows that the, how to look up the, comp, the namespace foo in the file system. It tries to load a file with um, name foo.srn, for example. It tries to read the file and create the abstract syntax tree, run the semantic analyzer on the AST, and finally, generate the target code for us and create the object file corresponding to that namespace and then we might have more than one namespace that which is usually the case and we're going to link these namespace on the object uh, layer and create a binary from them so that's the main purpose of namespaces um right now they're quite bare minimum but in the future we, we will see more and more uh, from them they usually map to a file on the file system but that's not always the case for example in a repl environment we can create a namespace on the fly add some stuff in that namespace do some stuff and then drop it or compile that namespace that doesn't have any uh, corresponding file on the file system in an object file right and finally a namespace obviously keeps the scope the environment environment and the scope are the same but i mean 
it keeps the state of the name and space itself. Another, another concept that uh, we're going to have a look at today is the serene context. Here's a confusing part. So if you read the source code, you will see that we have three different uh, contexts. One is the serene context, the LLVM context, and the MLIR context. Basically, they kind of, uh, they are the same concept, but for three different things. The serene context is the global state of the compiler for the serene compiler. It's the owner of the other two contexts. And it right now, it's, it's kind of a bare minimum as well, but it's going to hold any global state in the future. At the moment, it holds the namespace tables that I'm going to show you in a bit. Um, it might hold the primitive types in the future and things like that. The LLVM context is kind of the same. Uh, it plays the same role for the for creating LLVM, for generating LLVM IR. And MLIR obviously, again, does the same thing, but for generating MLIR uh, code. Um, that is it. Let's have a look at the uh, source code for uh, each of those. Let's just start by the context that uh, setting context. Sorry. So to begin with, we um, we already know about the expression class, the node class. They represent different uh, pieces of um, the EST. We have we have to kind of uh, define them here as well. We have a enum here that, uh, that is called compilation phase. It represents the current compilation phase of the compiler. So in previous episodes, we saw how we can ask the compiler to generate only, to dump all, only the AST or the result of the semantic analyzer. And in the future, you'll see how we can ask the compiler to just generate the SLIR or different IR representations that we have. With this enum, we can set the current uh, operational and compilation phase of the compiler. Uh, we're going to see how we use it in a bit. Here is the serene context. The main class that holds everything uh, is the owner of everything. We usually uh, pass a reference to this. Uh, we create a serene context in, in, in the highest, uh, like basically in the main function of the compiler, and we pass a reference uh, to it to different pieces that might need the context. As you can see, it's the owner of the LLVM context and the MLIR context. It has a pass manager. What is a pass manager? We're going to talk about it probably in the next episode or the episode after that. Uh, it, it basically is, is a pass manager for uh, MLIR. Um, let's let's uh, skip it for now. Uh, there's a string to the target triple. Uh, if you don't know what target triple is uh, just google it it's super simple it's just a string thing that uh what's the type of the machine that i'm running on like what's the vendor what's the like operation like not the operating system but uh, different information about the current uh, machine then uh, we have a function member insert ns <coughs> sorry we use this uh, this function to register a new namespace with the context, and we have another function called set current namespace or current ns that marks a namespace with the given name ns name to the current ns. So the current the concept of current namespace in the context is like. So for different namespaces, we need we at any given time uh, at any given point in time we're processing a namespace. We're trying to compile a namespace, right? We set the name of that uh, in a namespace as the current namespace of the context. So at any point in time, we would know what namespace we're compiling right now. We could have, instead of name, we could have like hold a 
I don't know, a shared pointer or a, like a raw pointer to the namespace. But I, I didn't put much thought of uh, into this. But I mean, if we in the future, if we want to have a uh, multi-threaded compiler, we don't. We might want to uh, like avoid using pointers, or we we need to have like a mutex of some sort or things like that. Uh, but Keeping a string is simple enough. Every thread can actually look up the current namespace on its own, and every thread might have a, like a uh, its own current namespace, you know. But uh, let's just keep that for now. It's it's a minor detail. Uh, get current namespace obviously returns a shared pointer to the current namespace. Get ns is like a getter function member function for uh, retrieving a namespace from the namespace table uh, obviously the constructor of the serine uh, context super simple it gets a um, sorry it gets a like a mlir context to create the uh, pass manager uh, sets the the compilation phase by default to no optimization we can set it later obviously and then here we try to load two mlir dialects the first one is the serine dialect which is our uh, main dialect for slir and the standard dialect what, what are dialects and how do we use them we're going to talk about them probably in the next episode but let's skip over them now. There's a to do here. Like I added this thing for uh, debugging some of the MLIR code that I was writing, uh, I was working on previously. Uh, yeah, I know I have to remove it, but uh, just to remind myself what I wa uh, wanted to do here, I keep it around. And finally, we set the target triple. Right now, we just look into the current machine. We, we, we're like, okay, we want to compile the input code to the target uh, for the current machine, for the machine that we're running on. But in the future, we should be able to, <clears throat> we should be able to set the target uh, ar um, architecture and like basically the target machine. We, we, we might want to uh, compile for ARM, for example, on a x86. But for now, we just compile for the current machine. Set the operation phase. Uh, as uh, I mentioned earlier, it, we just set the compiler phase to a phase. The default is, if, I, if I'm not mistaken, is no optimization. Yeah, like it's uh, here. If we want any other phase rather than that, we have to set it via this uh, member function. And then obviously the getter uh, function and the get optimization level. We're going to look at it uh, in a bit. So the private members. The target phase, uh, obviously the storage for the compilation phase we have the namespaces or the namespace table. This is just a map from namespace names to the shared pointer to, an, to that namespace. So whenever we, uh, we process a namespace, we need to register it with the context. We need to let the context know that we processed the, this namespace. It works as a cache as well. So let's say we process the namespace foo later on we we uh, come across another namespace that has a dependency to uh, namespace foo so we look into the namespace table to figure out uh, do we have that namespace already registered did we already process that namespace if yes just use the key or the name of the namespace which is in our case is foo retrieve the pointer and do whatever you want with it otherwise we we have to load it somehow we either go to the file system or some other means that are not uh, important at the moment and finally the storage for the current namespace okay also we have just one official way to create a namespace 
the function make certain context sorry to make it a certain context and that is make certain context that returns a unique pointer to an object of type uh, certain context now let's have a look at the implementation of context context here uh, as you can see the insert is quite simple just put the namespace the share pointer to the namespace into the namespace table and use the name property of the uh, ns as the key get an s the same just look look it up in the table if it exists return it otherwise uh, return a null pointer this is simple as well to set a set the uh, current ns we just uh, set the storage to point to the to hold the name of the new new current uh, namespace uh, the thing is i chose to return bool here because like right now there's no way that setting a name is the current namespace might fail but in the future we, we might need to kind of prevent setting the current uh, namespace to something else in under like uh, certain uh, circumstances but for now it's just a way for myself like i'm trying to remind myself my future self that we might want to actually uh, fail and prevent setting the current namespace here. That's why I'm uh, I did this. Um, get the current namespace again. Look into the uh, namespace. Ooh, I forgot about this one. This one uh, actually we have to look into the uh, namespace table uh, using the current namespace name as the key and just retrieve the pointer and return it as always uh, replace insert. the runtime check we don't want any insert i forgot about this one um okay set operation uh, phase this one is a little bit uh, might seem a little bit odd but i'm um, bear with me so as you know as i mentioned earlier we might have different phases for the compiler we might operate on different phases basically here we set the target phase that's obvious and depends on the phase that we want we need to do some other stuff for now, we only have to do two different things. So if we wanted to operate on any phase higher than generating MLIR, that includes generating lowered IR, LLVM IR, compiling to object code, compiling to, native, to target code, anything in that area, we need to add a new pass. What this pass is? Don't worry about it. We're going to have another episode about the pass management and MLIR passes, like even LLVM passes. Basically, what's going on is this pass is responsible for... Um, I'm doing air code right now, but this pass is uh, responsible to air code lowering the SLIR dialog to... Um, another dialect either uh, a standard dialect or any other type of dialect that we might need like i have to change the name uh, as well but that's what it does and if we were operating on any level higher than lir which is lower lowered ir we need to add another pass that is responsible for uh, generating to lower everything to uh, llvm ir that's all we need to know about this function and these passes. What are passes? I'm going to create another episode on those. Uh, so it's safe to skip them right now. And finally, get the uh, optimization level. Uh, like any other compiler, no optimization is O0 or 
nothing basically o1 o2 and finally o3 depend on the compilation phase that we're in and uh, finally makes sure in context just create a unique point easy peasy now let's have a look at the namespace Oops, too fast. So um, again, some of the things we had to we have to uh, define some of the things from the AST and other pieces that we uh, use on the namespace here. Also, we need to create two new types, maybe module and maybe module OP. Maybe module as the name suggests, is a result of type unique pointer to LLVM module and bool. If you like, if you can recall from previous episodes, result is just a, is a type that either holds a successful case or a failure case. In this case, the successful case uh, will have the type a unique pointer to a module and the failure case would be a value of type boolean why boolean because i'm kind of lazy uh, it should be errors that uh, it should be a, like an error type but i mentioned this earlier i'm not at the stage uh, I, i'm not reached that stage to write the error yet i need to finish the jit first and then uh, you like create the entire uh, error system subsystem so to that point i'm just using a bool here as a placeholder later i'm uh, later on i'm going to change it another uh, reason that i'm not free uh, i'm not getting into the error subsystem right now is that i'm reading about uh, different facilities that llvm has to work with errors to kind of come up with a good design for the error subsystem so i postponed the de uh, decision making and development process to the future for now i use the boolean value as the placeholder here what is llvm module definitely we're going to talk about it in the uh, next episode but for now you can think of it as a unit of comp compilation for llvm so it kind of makes sense to think that each namespace has a map uh, like maps to a one LLVM module in normal circumstances, but in a REPL environment, it might be one namespace mapping to many LLVM modules. But for now, one namespace, one LLVM module. And we have another type called maybe module OP. Module OP or module operation <clears throat> is the root operation in mlir what are operations what is module operation i'm going to talk about that one in the next episode as well sorry but basically module operations since mlir works on top of llvm module operation is kind of the llvm way to describe um, uh, describe an uh, llvm module and they kind of represent the LLVM oper uh, operation, sorry, the MLIR module operation represent the LLVM module and it translates to an uh, to a LLVM module. Anyway, it's too much module for now. Let's move on. And you can see uh, the namespace uh, class is kind of simple as well. It holds a reference to the uh, current in context it has a boolean to, to kind of uh, indicate whether the namespace is uh, initialized or not. We have an uh, atomic counter called fn counter. So in Serene, we might have, like, we definitely will have some anonymous functions. For example, we might have something like this. I'm writing a Serene code, right? A sudo code representing Serene. For example, let's define a function with uh, one argument x that returns um, what it, uh, it increments x by one and return the value, right? This thing is an anonymous function. It doesn't have a name, but we kind of, like it doesn't have the have a name 
from user perspective from the compiler perspective it must have a name we have to be able to point to this function with a name somehow right so usually how it works is that different compilers generate a name generate a unique name for any anonymous function and we do it like usually the case is we hold like we keep a counter and every time we use a we see a anonymous function we increment that counter by one and use that counter as part of the name of that function so that like in different languages it works differently but in serene for example my plan is to use something like sorry like serene oops serene fn and the counter for example the value of counter might be three right so this would be the name of the third uh, or fourth uh, anonymous function in the na uh, name space that's why we keep a uh, atomic counter um, just to generate unique names for anonymous functions and it's atomic because in the future if we have multiple threads actually uh, processing one namespace we don't want to make mistakes and generate duplicates and finally the context uh, the content of the namespace which is the ast that represent the source code of that namespace each namespace have a name it must have a name so uh, let's let's talk about closure for a second in closure when you uh, want to create a new file when you want to create a new namespace you use the ns special form and you say like foo oops foo dot bar and then if you have any dependency you load them here and things like that right this foo dot bar is actually the name of the current namespace we might have another namespace called foo.buzz, for example, right? So the way Clojure loads the namespace from the file system is to look at the foo directory for a file called buzz.clj. Uh, we're going to do the same because like, it's super simple and kind of obvious. Programmers are used to this kind of thing. Uh, to this uh, kind of uh, process to load a module or namespace based on directory and files so the entire thing would be the name of the namespace so foo.buzz is the name is the current name uh, okay and it might be optionally mapped to a file name and um, I, I guess i already talked about the llvm optional type it either holds a, a string or llvm none so in this case we uh, for namespaces we can provide a file name okay we have uh, two environments what are environments i'm going to talk about them shortly but you environment actually is a concept coming out of the original list paper by john mccarthy you can think of it as a scope, right? So we have an environment for the sem uh, called the semantic environment, and another one called symbol table. I might need to change the symbol table because we have another concept called symbol table for the JIT at the moment, so it might get a little bit confusing. But for now, it's fine. Um, as I mentioned, if I change it, I'm going to document it and have an episode about it. So. The first environment, which is the semantic environment, is the mapping from strings to AST nodes. So the a string itself is like would be the name of that node. Or for example, uh, we create a new binding from a name like foo to a value of a new like a, to an expression. The key when we want to put that binding into our semantic environment we use the string foo and the value obviously would be the node that uh, represent that expression right 
we use the semantic environment for our semantic analysis phase if you remember from the previous episodes uh, when we want to define a new uh, binding uh, i'm going to go back and show show you the code uh, actually let's do it right now uh, what was the file name def dot cpp yeah Let, oh here as you can see uh the ctx is the serene context you already know get current name and space return the current name and space that we're processing then we have the semantic environment that we're talking about at the moment it has a, a function member function called insert symbol so insert symbol uh gets an string uh and the value the string is the binding name that the if you remember where's the binding binding is a symbol a binding 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 here as you can see binding is a symbol so it, it must have a name we use the name of that symbol and assign the like and create a binding from that name to the analyzed value which is the uh kind of the result of the semantic analysis phase running on the value of the definition right and we put it in the semantic environment then later on we use the semantic on, uh, environment to figure out whether uh, something is defined in the current namespace or the current scope or not and if it's not raise an error or otherwise uh, continue what you're doing you know it's basically an scope um for example just to give you an example when we we have a function call actually i don't know if i already implemented that or not let's have a look mm. let's have a look i guess i did yeah so later on when for example we have a function call the we look at the first uh we look at the first element of the list of the list sorry so a function called if you if you recall from the previous episode is like blah one right this blah here is the name of the function we're trying to call and this is the first argument right so what happens here is we try to uh cast the first element that blah to a symbol if it was a symbol it means it ha like it's a symbol that points to a function not points like let's uh, let's not uh, confuse ourselves with pointers that refers to a point uh, to a function right uh, that as like that name is assigned to a function so we look into the current namespace and the semantic environment of that namespace and look up that name is there such thing in our uh, semantic environment if it was good continue if it wasn't like it's a, it's a semantic error we can't resolve the symbol name blah to anything right so we can fail the semantic analyzer that's how we use the semantic environment um going back and the symbol table it like works the same but it works in a different phase of the compilation it's a it's a mapping from a string refs to mlir values what is mlir value and where do we use symbol table it's coming up in the next uh, episode or the one after that finally the constructor of the namespace as you can expect a reference to the serine context a name for the namespace and an optional file name we have another function to uh, get we have like a couple of functions to get and set the content content of the namespace like the ast another function to just increment the uh, counter the function counter get the reference to the yes to the serine context and two of the most important functions excuse me the generate function and compile to llvm function 
I'm not going to talk about them in this episode. They're part of our discussion about LLVM and MLIR that I'm going to start on, um, from the next episode. But basically, generate generates some kind of MLIR uh, IR. <laughs> Uh, depends on the compilation phase, the return module uh, operation might be in SLIR, MLIR, LIR, uh, one of these three, right? And finally, the compile to LLVM uh, calls generate uh, inside of it, generate the IR, compile that IR and convert it to LLVM IR, and finally uh, return an LLVM module con containing the uh, LLVM IR. Also, we have another member function called run passes. Uh, it it uh, it runs the pass manager on the given module operation. Uh, we're going to talk about it in the future episode as well. It's not important at the moment. A dump function that dumps the uh, namespace for uh, debugging purposes. Uh, file finally the destructor. Also, we have another, uh, just one official way to create uh, namespaces uh, that is make namespace. It takes a, a reference to the context, the name, the file name, and a Boolean value indicating whether uh, this function has to more uh, has to set the current like the namespace that it's going to create as the current namespace in the context or not. Let's have a look at the implementation namespace. Okay. Creating a namespace is simple. Just some initializing some values. And if the file name has a, had a value, just set the file name to that uh, value. Get name, uh, get tree, simple. Set tree is kind of simple. The only thing that we do is if we already initialized we fail namespaces are kind of uh, has to be uh, mutable it's a decision for now it might change in the future because uh, as i mentioned i'm working on the jit at the moment and i i don't know whether i want to uh keep namespaces as immutable entities and when every time i add a new expression to the namespace just generate a new namespace that might work I, I have no idea at the moment but when i'm thinking about the REPL environment it's kind of put me in a weird uh situation uh, I, I can't decide yet i don't have enough data enough input to make that decision but for now we treat it as an immutable entity so we set it once set the environment once Set, sorry, set the AST ones, and later on, if we already had the AST, we're not going to do anything. Also, as you can see here, the namespace would be the owner of the AST, right? So we move the ownership to the tree attribute, and we're going to own the AST. Uh, create a namespace, uh, that function that we use actually it's better to move this thing to the bottom really quick yeah because you know it's easier for our eyes to track the changes what it does is to uh, call the make share to create a shared pointer for that uh, for the namespace uh, get the pointer insert it in the uh, use insert ns as we saw earlier insert it into the context and if the set current value uh, flag was uh, true is true then set it try to set it and finally return the pointer nothing special right okay let's move on we saw the set tree as well increment uh, the next fn counter is super simple this is simple I'm not going to talk about the generate uh, method here and also run passes uh, or compile to LLVM in fact because you need to know more about LLVM and MLIR so they deserve their own uh, episode as well. Next episode we're going to start talking about LLVM and MLIR but for now let's skip them. The 
dump function is quite simple generate the module if the module was there just dump it call dump on it that's it done right but let's have a look at the final piece of the puzzle which is the environment it's super simple like literally it's just a class that has two template types k and v so as you saw how we used it in the namespace k here is the type of the key and v is the type of the value it has a it just uh, like keeps a pointer to the parent so environments can have a, like a hierarchy of uh, we can have a, like a hierarchy of environments each environment might have a parent basically the root scope of the namespace doesn't have any parent so that's how we figure out whether um, an environment is the parent environment or not is the root environment or not if it doesn't have a parent so it's it must be the root environment and it has a, like a storage which we call pairs for uh, it's like a dense map dense map is a, like a map type in llvm if you interested to know how like what is a dense map and why we we're using it look into the llvm programming manual uh, basically the pairs are is uh, the pairs attribute is just a storage for our bindings the constructors are nothing special we have just two methods the sorry two member functions lookup and insert symbol as you can see the lookup is uh, is a function that returns an optional value optional i already talked about it it might return a value of type v or llvm non so it we give the uh, we pass a key of type k to uh, to this function it, it looks it up first in its own storage if it was if it found any value it returns it otherwise if it has a, a parent it looks up the value in in the parent so this way we kind of keep looking into our parents till we get to the root uh, environment and in the root environment if we didn't find the key we just simply return none insert symbol is quite simple it just gets a key and a value and store it in the storage in the pair uh, oh sorry that <laughs> this is not a pair from uh, our uh, attribute this is the attribute this is like the standard pair pair and return success upon uh, like finishing the operation it, it's kind of uh, redundant to do this here but again in the future we might do more stuff in insert symbol that m might cause the whole operation whole inserting operation to fail so for now we don't have anything to uh, that causes the failure so we just return success one thing that you should know is that i already mentioned it in the docs in the comments above if we have as like a, let's say we want to insert key foo with a value in, in 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 a in an environment if the key foo exists in the parent environment by adding the, by inserting the foo in current environment we're shadowing the parent one so if the value of foo in the parent environment is four for example and we are inserting foo with five the value of five then in the current environment the value of foo is five not four that's kind of obvious for Lisp users but it, it might confuse some, uh, some users uh we'll see it in action in the future when we get to write some serene code itself okay um i guess that is uh, that's it for today uh, we we talked about some of the missing pieces from the semantic analysis phase and now you must be able you should be able to actually uh, read the entire semantic analysis uh, code and have, like, understand it quite easy um thank you for sticking around and please uh, subscribe to my channel if you like my work uh, leave a like and share your feedback with me thank you and uh, have a great day